Uh, this is uh, September the 4th, 2011, in a world that seems to be falling apart pretty much everywhere. I'm Michael C. Rupert. Welcome back <clears throat> to a nightclub at the end of the world and the lifeboat hour. I'm believing that uh, you can hear me out there. Maybe the board operator will signal if, if, uh, if, my, if my sound is coming through. Okay, well, uh, uh, I'm just going to speak directly uh, to the board operator and say that uh, we may have a problem when we try to bring Peter in. If we do, we will stop. I will uh, change some equipment, and we'll try to do something to make sure this is a very important show tonight, an extremely important show. I want to start uh, by honoring uh, two uh, wonderful assets of CollapseNet, who are both longtime friends of mine, have known for a long time. Uh, if you're CollapseNet members and you know now that uh, we are the most useful news organization in the world, uh, but there's two people who are key in bringing you the, the incredible flow of information that we bring to you on a, on a daily basis, sometimes almost 24-7, and that's the wonderful Jenna Orkin uh, in New York City and uh, the, the in, indomitable rice farmer, uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, an American living in Japan um, who we have a lot in common, and he has just been an absolute rock. I'd like to honor them both tonight, and they're, they're both... By the way, you know, we, last week we were down because we had uh, a hurricane passing through uh, the Northeast, which uh, pretty much played out uh, like we thought it would have collapsed net. Um, FEMA is broke. That's what I was telling you was going to happen. And uh, businesses are failing. And there's a quiet disaster uh, happening throughout the region. FEMA is, is just out of money. And it's uh, it's been said in press stories that, uh, as we predicted, that uh, – uh, the money to rescue the people in Vermont and help them rebuild is going to have to come out of other places like social programs. That was just a footnote in a couple of stories. But on CollapseNet this week, we also uh, reported to you that the federal flood insurance program is insolvent. So there's a lot of people who think they're going to get bailouts from Uncle Sam or are going to be disappointed very soon. But things are moving uh, with incredible speed, and we know that th we can all tell that the tempo uh, of events, the uh, the uh, frequency of the body blows are, are, is is increasing, uh, and the body blows are coming from all directions. Last week we only had one uh, hur hurricane to deal with. We, now we have Tropical Storm Lee and Hurricane Katya, which looks like she's going to bounce off uh, without doing much damage. But in Japan, Typhoon Talus, um, which is where Rice Farmer is, uh, has dumped like 17 inches of rain in 24 hours and has killed at least 20 people. Uh, the uh, we, we have uh, floods, droughts, earthquakes, hurricanes, uh, out of control wildfires, um, and these events are coming <clears throat> just as rapidly now as the economic blows are coming. And uh, sadly, it's it's not being covered very much everywhere. Uh, how quickly the world is is moving towards a global conflict, which looks like it would wind up pulling the United States, China, Iran, Russia, everybody into it. Uh, we, we, we've been bringing that information to you. So time now is precious. Um, and I can't help but uh, uh, observe that the, the, uh, the quickening which is taking place in events. I mean, it seems like we had long drum beats, like between 9-11 uh, uh, and the invasion of Iraq and uh, the tsunami in the Indian Ocean. You know, there were years, and, but now there's not so much time in between. And, and I am seeing and experiencing that the energy levels, vibrations, if you will, are changing. Now, I, uh, I'm standing detached from the Mayan calendar and from all of the prophecies that everybody has now lingering uh, in, in their head, and all I can do being a journalist that I am uh, and the detective that I have been is compare the facts and look at what the prophecies have said and say, uh, you have my attention. Um, and I am experiencing all of this. Of course, it's painful uh, to watch the, the suffering, much of which is needless until you change the way money works. You've changed nothing. Uh, watching all this suffering, but there is also a deep part of me that has a childlike curiosity, uh, eyes open wide in wonder at events the way they're playing out. Our guest tonight has been on the show once before, uh, and he's, uh, he's a treat for me to talk to. He's, he's an intellectual steak dinner for a good conversation. I've never seen anybody in my life so eloquently describe the evils of infinite growth 
an utterly corrupt economic system. His name is Peter Joseph. He is a director. He's a writer. He is he is dubbed the founder or the godfather of the zeitgeist movement. And uh, we've uh, developed a good friendship, and our movements have crossed. Uh, and, and we have uh, many, many things in common, but we're standing on the same side of the infinite growth paradigm. Uh, but time is uh, time is important, and our focus is important. We have to be careful what we spend our words on because uh, there's so much happening so fast. So, uh, first of all, let me see if we have successfully done this. And Peter Joseph, can I welcome you back to the Lifeboat Hour? Yes, you can, Mike. Hey, really Peter, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me back on. How are right. you doing? We we got our technical issues uh, solved. Um, and Good. I, I kind of want to start off the show because there's a lot going on, and I know you guys are busy and we're busy. And I got an email, um, and you can take all the time you want to during the course of talking tonight to describe what Zeitgeist is doing, what you got coming up, anything else. But there's a Zeitgeist member named Lee Deathcare Nelson who sent me an, an email. He's also a CollapseNet member, um, and he wrote this. He wrote. I'm a paying member of CollapseNet and also a Zeitgeist member, and I would like it, uh, if possible, to, to ask Peter about street activism. As you know, the movement likes to be involved in street activism, and with more protests emerging, Zeitgeisters will be on the streets. But your good self have advised us to stay away from these in your latest blog, Say My Name. What does PJ think? Does he even believe we are in collapse? I do. Peter, that kind of seems like a way to open this up so that we can have a good talk. Sure, sure. Well, obviously, I've talked about it. Uh, like I was moving forward, you know, by the way, it was just hit 10 million views in seven months, and thank They're you kidding. for your contribution on that. Yep, that's just one post. Uh, we obviously mentioned that. I obviously mentioned that in that film at great length at the very end as far as the looming collapse from many different angles, which, again, we can expand upon from the unemploy unemployment collapse to the energy collapse to the debt collapse. Uh, as far as protest things, well, I think protests in general, you know, they serve a unique role for attention. They have worked in the past, and I think there's good historical precedent for it. But we need really an educational uh, approach to this. That's why the Zeitgeist Movement approaches the public through many different event structures. Instead of, you know, yelling at the street, holding up signs, you know, there's a place for that. And we have, when we in the movement work and engage protests, we don't usually generate the protest, but we go into it and we work to be a part of it and also talk to the people that are protesting and make sure that they know what's going on because you know how people can be. They can get really angry and irrational. We see all sorts of you know, upheaval across the world right now. And the question is, whenever I see this, is like, do they really understand what's happening? Do they really know what to expect? And do they know what the solution might be? And then if those you know, issues aren't met, then they might as well just be yelling you know, at a brick wall. Exactly. Um, there's a big difference between protesting and rioting, by the way. I just thought I would make that distinction for me and my listeners. I mean, I'm, you know, I do not want to see any violence anywhere, and, and, and I'm really afraid of what the government intends after that. Peter, sure. let me ask you this. Um, obviously, within the last year or so, or certainly since the last time you've been on this show, uh, things have gotten a lot worse out there, pretty much in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, Accordance with a with with a model I've devised, in which we use at, at at CollapseNet, is Zeitgeist aware of and or responding or adapting in any way to uh, outside events right now that the collapse is taking place? Well, I would say so. I mean, we're we we've, we've stepped up our educational initiatives. I mean, at the at the end of the day, it's really we can't do anything without the public understanding what's happening, and that's mm -hmm. why I continually re, uh, reiterate that. As far as you know, the way things are going, you know, the three issues that I pointed out, unemployment, energy, and debt, uh, all of our materials continue to cycle this through. All of my talks always go through this process because what it reveals is a failure of a paradigm, which in my mind, we can talk more about this, was always a failure. The entire system we live in was a failure from the very beginning, but it didn't have the type of environmental and, um, well, biocycle, Biosocial pressures, meaning we didn't. We live in the infinite growth assumptions, as you you know you always point out. Everyone's always assumed with all of our social models that we will never run out of anything. We'll never be able to not overcome some type of problem. Well, How foolish! This is yes, of course. I mean, this well, that's not a total assumption of history. I mean, obviously we had I mean, you know, First Nations people. They were smart enough to understand this stuff, but we've become so messed up and distorted. I mean, normality is distortion today. So uh, anyway, we in all of our materials, we always reiterate all of that. And I think we have, in your approach, in your communication, you have a variation of the theme that we approach with. 
And I think that's a great thing because we tackle the same idea but from different angles. For example, if you don't mind me jumping into the unemployment issue, which sure. everyone is, you know, we have all these pundits and, and all of our lovely presidential candidates claiming they will be the ones to bring back the jobs. Uh, you know what? None of these people even understand what they're talking about because the automation of labor, which has been growing exponentially since the Industrial Revolution, is what has been robbing all of the jobs. Exactly. Uh, I mean, and no one's commenting on this in a real political sense. Roosevelt sort of knew this during the Great Depression. He was attempting to create a half work day to try and have the work day, give incentives to the corporations to allow another half of the population to become employed again. But the corporations, of course, didn't want to do that. They're responsible to their shareholders and all the profit motives that go in with that. So it's never, never a possibility, really, unless massive, you know, ooh, socialist policies were imposed, of course, upon these corporations. And I think we can guarantee that not happening. But until people realize this trend and the phasing out, uh, basically, of human labor, Right. This is what's happening. It's a paradigm shift of the very market, monetary market model, and it's not going to stop. Why? Because automation of labor always leads to cost efficiency, which always leads to reduction of purchasing power. So one way or another, as the corporations fail, like all the other debt-ridden institutions, they're going to automate because it's cheaper in the long run, at least in their mind, but they don't realize they're displacing labor, they're displacing purchasing power, and they're displacing their income. So it's a cycle that is just a cipher going straight into itself for an inevit inevitable destruction. Yeah, it's, so that's yeah, something that, it's yeah. like I was saying uh when uh, when when the current round of economic collapse uh, began the end of July, early August, like I said it would, what I was seeing was that corporations in, in a desperate need, uh, a stupid need, if you will, to show profit, laid off 30,000 employees to cut costs. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah. you know. It's the same paradox. There is an yeah. insane, deadly logic that kind of leads, leads one to suspect that the only way that this system will ever be satisfied is by killing everything. Well, it, it's going to self-destruct one way or another. Uh, the question is, can we step in to sort of limit how bad it might get? And that's, you know, that's really what I think you and I both hope for. That, my friend, is the $64 trillion question, what do numbers mean anymore? Uh, we're going to come sure. back and talk about that after we do a song. Uh, we have a, 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 a new song by... Okay, we're back with Peter Joseph, and we just asked a $64 trillion question, which was, how do we unplug this beast? Um, first thing that pops to my mind is, is global debt repudiation. Peter, what do you think about that? Yeah, I'm imagining uh, you know, somebody with a, a hint of sanity walking up in front of the United Nations and saying, hey, guys, why don't we just cancel all debts, debts before it strangles us to death? You know? Yeah. I often yeah. use an example in my lectures about a little island with a bunch of shells, and then they realize they're, they're charging interest that doesn't exist, and they you make a very easy point out of it. But it's amazing to me how people don't see the, the flaw in this very simple mathematical equation that we've been doing. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's like uh, all these ones and zeros that are, in a sense, mythical. They're, they're ethereal beings, these ones and zeros, this fiat right. currency. Um, yeah. a, a, and yet this, this spirit, if you will, is, that's kind of like defining God because they, they determine what happens in our material world. Mm -hmm. um, and we worship the money, m money like a god. I think that's why the eyeball's right on top of the pyramid. It's the big joke, you know, the money is laughing. <laughs> I'm the god. I'm God. In God we in trust. God we trust. trust in me. I'm money. Um, yeah. But um, it's clear that, to, to me, that a proactive uh, approach is needed now to unplug this paradigm, which is systematically eating everything and, and, and leaving us less and less to, to, to build with and less time, less resources to implement uh, some of the great things that Zeitgeist Movement uh, uh, seeks, to, seeks to do. Um, uh, sure. So how can we get proactive? Well, I mean, uh, I hate to sound redundant, but until people understand the problem, which is you know, one of the first things I talk about in, in you know, lectures that I give is try to point out this debt issue. The first thing I'll mention to any political figure or anyone that I see that's even remotely close to such institutions, uh, in fact, I recently asked somebody at a, at a fundraiser I just happened to be at who was running for president on the Republican side. I had brought up that exact question. <laughs> and, of course, his hands, you know, he had, he had no idea how to respond to such a thing because it, they don't even think about it. They don't know 
how the internal dynamics of the economic structure really works. Ron Paul is one of the few. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously we need to vote for Ron Paul if he if he gets up there. That's the first like minor thing we could do if we want to engage the political system. But you know, in the end, until full debt forgiveness is realized as the only solution, uh, we're 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 just going to continue this slow grind. We're not going to be able to afford all the things you mentioned earlier in this broadcast as far as the natural disasters that are steeping up. You know, we're, we're in this grind, and we're, we're, you know, we're eventually we're going to go exponential because the exponential collapse, as I would call it, because the, between the unemployment, the energy, and the debt issue, energy, unlike employment and debt, energy is fixed. You know, we know peak oil is confirmed. You know, the German military think tank just leaked something recently. Yeah. That confirms 15 years. We've seen this confirmation everywhere, and we can see it in the behavior of all of these institutions as well. So, you know, that is the fixed element, which, again, uh, not to ramble here, but goes on to the war issue. We're going to have real wars eventually, not like yeah. World War One or World War Two, no. not contrivance wars. We're going to have wars for survival. Maybe that's very, not going to be pretty. Soon. I, uh, I wouldn't surprise me. Just all it takes is one incident, you know, however you want to interpret that one, uh, given uh, we come up on the anniversary of 9-11. But uh, the political powers that be are, are scratching their heads trying to figure out how they're going to maintain their establishment by all means. And uh, it's frightening to see how much money is being spent and has, how those increases have continued despite economic collapse in all the dominant powers. So, but all back to your which point... Is- I'm sorry, go ahead. All of which is more rapidly diminishing resources for the wrong purposes. Yeah, obviously. I mean, what else is new, you know? Uh, One of the things we talk about as an aside, you know, if we just think about all that energy and time spent in the military-industrial complex, brilliant scientists, uh, well, brilliant in the sense of their skill set, not brilliant in their their social awareness, obviously. Uh, if we applied that toward a renovation of renewable energies, we applied that towards creating a system that's actually sustainable, we could do it very, very rapidly. And that's a very important part, the other side, if you will, of what the Zeitgeist Movement is talking about. We just have to get our priorities straight as the human civilization that we are, forget all the old baggage, and God, if we can just get ourselves in line with a, a real path, I mean, as, as easy as it sounds, obviously it's the most difficult thing in the world, but this is the frustration of what we bang our heads against every day. I'm seeing a, a, a couple of optimistic signs. Recently, there's a columnist named Paul Farrell who writes for Market Watch, and mm. uh, he's a pretty cantankerous, cranky guy, and, and he's, he's pretty fun sometimes, but uh, this week we had it on the World News Desk at CollapseNet, um, he posted this scathing, scathing rip apart of the infinite growth paradigm all the time. And, and, and what, what I commented on uh, for our members at CollapseNet was I said, at, at long last, uh, many voices are becoming one. Mm. And that's been kind of uh, something I've been pursuing through CollapseNet and through this radio show is that it's uh, that our collapse net members, the zeitgeisters, the transition U.S. movement, uh, the environmental movement can all ultimately say with one voice, and I'm and I'm hoping that the quick, quickening brings us that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, absolutely. So that we can join together. What is? I mean, what is I- I'm sorry. Go, go. go. I was just going to say real fast that uh, it reminded me what you just stated of a of a Carl Sagan quote of about 25 years ago when the early onset of of CO2 emissions and all of that stuff with global warming, as we sort of call it today, was starting to hit the scientific community. And he said, he said in a very prophetic sense, he said, the problems that are going to arise from the system that we have now are going to force humanity to eventually come together to share at least a fundamental value set. And that, even though it comes out of, you know, a sort of destructive chaos, that will be a very positive place to be in if we can survive once, you know, we get to that point. So we have to get to that point, and we have to get through that point. Yeah. And right now, all of this quickening brings with it something that I know you'll find interesting, and I think it's important enough to talk about, is that uh, I think that it's very clear to me, because I have my, my antenna out you know, everywhere, that Zeitgeist is very effective. It's, it's obvious. You have members in 70 countries. You know, you 10 million views for Zeitgeist 4, uh, three, which was a pretty good yeah, movie. I'm not saying that because I'm in it. Um, but you're effective, and that scares people, and so am I, and that scares people. But it, it appears that you and I have both attracted uh, the cunning wile of a guy named Alex Jones. Uh, and, yeah. and I think it's important to talk about that for a minute okay. because okay. of the approaches that they're taking. Sometimes you measure people by their enemies. 
um, and uh, and and it's important to talk about that. He's he's thrown some really lame stuff at you, but he's he's a. Uh, He's not coming after me that way. He's spending enormous amounts of money uh, producing uh, films and videos and uh, uh, copying almost all of my work with, one ex- with a few exceptions. He will not acknowledge peak oil. He uh, does not uh, uh, disavow the infinite growth economic paradigm, and no. he doesn't believe that climate change is, is man-made. Other than that, gee, he's perfectly one of us. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure about that last point either in the sense of value system, but what I will say is um, there are many people out there that sort of paint this picture of themselves as being, quote, truth seekers, that you know, they want a better world, but obviously their actions don't relate to anything scientific. I mean, scientific really is the ultimate truth if you're willing to investigate, question yourself, question everything that you know, and allow the objectivity to come through. If Alex Jones is objective, he would see the obvious flaws of what I call the, you know, the free-for-all market and its anarchy that it will inevitably push forward all these problems we talk about because that's the very nature of what the system demands. He would eventually realize that uh, obviously peak oil is real. He has a very weird motivation not to address that. One of the big flaws I see also with a lot of people is that they, they'll say something, and if they're wrong, they will never go back and correct themselves just because they're in the public mind and they don't want to ever appear to be wrong. Yeah. And that's, I think, an unfortunate flaw. But he's only one of many that uh, have taken numerous shots at the movement and attempt to do anything they can to pollute the message. And the beauty of it all is is that we are just operating on very sound rationale with respect to our observations. Mm-hmm. And uh, there, no one will debate any of the issues. Just like I bet no one will debate the issues with you, Mike. What they do is they just attack they attack and they call you names and they, they, they create all these false prima facie associations and build these straw men. Oh, I must be a, you know, I must be a Marxist because, you know, Jones and a lot of those individuals, they just said we're all Marxists because of what we talk about with the market system. But they don't realize the rationale. You can't have, in a, in a paradigm where our technology is exceeding human capacity, how can you defend the market system that's going to use that capacity for cost efficiency, displacing people's purchasing power, and eventually creating rampant unemployment that can't stop. That's right. You know what I mean? Like, so the logic is always there, but they just can't see it because of their values, and that's really the flaw of most people is their values, you know? Well, here's, here's something that I'm taking about this because I spend a lot of my time watching the media. We know that. Sure. And, and, and that's that not only the media, but people like Alex Jones are becoming more transparently, pathetically um, gibberish, yeah. Like all the time, it's destructive, uh, and 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 so uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm watching the, the the cascade of events that's taking place with this kind of wonderment to see how this is going to come out. Yeah. Uh, but it is sure. so important that we stop infinite growth, that we kill that economic beast, because debt is what will crush everything. Um, let, me, let me make one point, too, since you brought that subject up that just popped in my mind that I think is very important for all of us to think about is that when it comes to causality, uh, I grew up, you know, and I, I fell into, you know, my own little you know, awakenings and such and listened to so many different people, and most of the time people blame other people. You know this. Everyone wants to blame somebody else, some group. You know, we have the absurdity of these, like the Illuminati or then the New World Order and then all this stuff, and it's all out there. And then, of course, on the normal plane, there's the Republicans and the Democrats. They must be to blame. Who's, who's at fault now? Uh, as though that, that actually explains any type of causality. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. When you recognize the human being as, as this developed organism, obviously with massive genetic programming from of eons of evolution, but when you analyze our behaviors and our brain structure, which hasn't changed, much in thousands of years, we can behave in so many different ways. It's what the system enables us. It's what the system reinforces in our behavior that defines us. And that's the flaw of all these people out there, and it's, that's 90% of most of those that argue and debate uh, about whatever social problem. They want to find someone to blame. They never, ever look at the system, and that's what the movement really is about at its core. I'm giving a, uh, Peter, I'm, I'm giving a speech in Portland on September 11th. That's next Sunday. Uh, Sunday. Oh, by the way, a programming note for everybody. Uh, I will not be on next Sunday. The, your guest host will be Carolyn Baker, who we've all come to know and love here. She'll be sitting in for me giving a big speech uh, at the First Unitarian Church in Portland. And, Peter, one of the things that I'm going to be talking about there that I see is so essential right now is a concept that I call change without punishment, Mm. that what is so absolutely essential for the entire human race now to survive without 
nuking the planet to death, poisoning it, putting everybody out of work, destroying everything, uh, is, is for the ability for, for the, an open door for human consciousness to just change. Right. With no shame attached. It's like adding up a column of numbers with a pencil. You know, oh, I made a mistake. You take the eraser, you, you fix it, and, and there's, you don't give yourself 50 lashes for that. You just change. Sure. Right. Uh, uh, and and that's gonna, that's a hard lesson because as a as a civilization, human culture is kind of addicted addicted oh, yeah. to punishment and blame. Addicted to punishment, blame, addicted to credit, addicted to identity, and you see it echoed and reinforced. Excuse me, in the market system, you know, if someone invents something, they want to, you know, have their patent and everything. And if someone has an idea, you know, we, what's the, you know, you see this in political usage too, which has a huge influence on people. What did Bush use against Kerry years ago? The flip flop. Remember, he was flip flops. You know, these are the things that are so permeant, that permeate so extensively in the culture. So I, I think that sounds like a great lecture. I look forward to hearing it. Mike. Yeah, I'm. Uh, this is this is a fun speech to write. There's a lot of power flowing right now. It's uh, it's it's thrilling to write when your life is on the line and you know it. You know, it's uh, yeah. adds a little spice to it. Um, I have a I have an email. By the way, if you'd like to call in and ask Peter Joseph a question tonight, the number is one eight 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 seven four. Four eight 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 seven four four eight eight eight, or you can email me directly uh, at uh, lifeboathour at collapsenet dot com, and that's exactly what Rick Dawson did. Hi, Rick, and you got this uh, email for you, Peter. Without getting into a religious debate, what about the Old Testament concept of jubilee? I uh, I'm not familiar with it, Peter. Are you? <laughs> Uh, Old Testament concept of jubilee. I, I know what the word jubilee means, but I'm afraid I, I can't answer that because I'm not sure the context. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't I have Old Testament on hand. <laughs> uh, this is not Old Testament wisdom. This is like common sense. It's like what we have to do is to get rid of all of the debt, which is a $1.4 quadrillion dollar derivatives yeah. bubble that is I now am. imploding. And, and, and stop the system from generating more debt, which eventually creates a causal effect that will lead to the removal of the entire monetary market paradigm. The, yes, the yes. debt system is part of the market system because it's the selling of money. Money is treated like a commodity, and that's the intrinsic flaw, you know. Well, <laughs> the whole thing is a flaw, if you yeah. ask me. Sure. Uh, Zevin Cruz writes in, what do you think of Adbusters and Anonymous uh, uh, Tarin Square occupation of Wall Street, uh, maybe that's Tiananmen Square, occupation of Wall Street on September 17 for several months. If you are unfamiliar with it, go to adbusters.org. Well, all I can say is I hope somebody does something that's not violent right. to change something very quickly. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Peter, I agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more as far as the nonviolent issue. Um, as you mentioned earlier on, I think you mentioned, or I meant, maybe I heard you mention it somewhere else, uh, the only thing violence accomplishes is more military police, more advanced weapons to use against you, and you just really can't, you can't go up against uh, these, these powerful technological military institutions no. as of now, at least not in the numbers that you're seeing in these in traditional protests. So. <laughs> The military anyway, now, uh, now has area denial weapons that include I infrared beams that make you feel like you're getting a third degree burn and ear yep, splitting yep. Uh, sonic waves, and they're just itching to use that stuff. No, I'm it's, sorry, Peter, it's, I cut it's you horrifying. Off. No, no, it, 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 rightfully so, it's horrifying. Uh, anonymous is interesting. Okay, we've got I'm, another email from Enrique okay. Gutierrez. Yo, Mike, what up? Hey, man. This is Enrique from Culver City. Okay, this, oh, he's doing the personal thing. Where's the question? I'm torn on whether or not I should stay here and become the goat shepherd and go back and share what knowledge I'm learning about permaculture. Uh, that brings up a whole host of uh, issues that you, you might take some time to talk about, Peter. Is um, What is Zeitgeist? Uh, is there any activity inside Zeitgeist that's making active preparation uh, for events now? Well, no, that's that's kind of uh, the world you're in. We are we're trying our best with the assumption that we can take a hold of this system before it gets to a point where everyone needs to flee. I think in the back of everyone's mind, though, that is involved in the movement and understands it, they realize the difficulty of of this approach. They realize that they have to have fail safes. They realize, like for example, I'm working on dual citizenship in another place. I have another location that uh, that I, I consider a possibility of getting out mm -hmm. and starting a sustainable small area for myself in the event I feel the need to do so. I'm not making plans, but it's in the back of my mind. I, I'm thinking just like your lifeboat um, 
you like the notion and your organization talks about as well. So it's there, but uh, well, that's not really what the movement's about. That's we're trying to really push with information movement. I mean, I can go through a list of the types of programs we have, but uh, generally speaking, uh, we're really trying to get as many people out there, unify the world with this sort of common value system, a recognition of the problems, and try our best to kind of take hold of this before we get to that point where, you know, it could be the point of no return, at least for a certain period of time, you know. Mm -hmm. We have a caller on the line, uh, Clyde. Nelson, B.C. I don't know if your name is Nelson and you live in Clyde, British Columbia, or you'll straighten this out. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Who are you? Uh, my name is Clyde Beatty. I'm oh. from British Columbia, Canada. Good, great. I, Hi, welcome. What the, oh, thanks. What, what do you want to ask? Okay, I just read on a Zeitgeist forum recently that um, a group of about 90 members uh, put forward a proposal, and Joseph said that he isn't going to recognize the group anymore and doesn't like the way they're trying to bureaucratize things. And I'm just wondering if Joseph could talk about that and his views. No, because basically it's not worth the conversation for this radio program. It's an internal argument amongst people okay. that have ideas for coordination, and it's not worth the audience to listen to. Okay. All right, then. Thank you. Sure. Hey, hey Peter. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay, okay. You, you, you know, it, it's important to have the discipline to know that, you know, airtime air is precious and so is the time that we put into our heads and what we worry about, and we've got a lot of other things to worry about. Uh, this is from Rick, who sent us the message about Jubilee. Jubilee was every 50 years, all debts were canceled and all lands restored to the original owners, in summary. That's the short version. Well, yeah, that's basically the right idea. Peter, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, it, there's a certain number of uh, traditional assumptions in there, such as personal property, right. and this goes on a lot of different uh, complex, you know, things that a lot of people aren't familiar with the way I view, and the way a lot of people view, and from a rational standpoint of how we should share our environment as a species. But yeah, yeah I could sort of see the logic there, very <laughs> in a loose way, sure. Yeah, what you don't want to do under any circumstances is recreate the wheel. That's why, well, along with that. Repudiation, forgiveness globally, um, you know, I have to add on to that. You have to eliminate compound interest, fiat currency, and fractional yeah. reserve banking, or else all you're going to do is recreate the same mess all over again. Absolutely. That would be the first step, by all means. Yeah. Okay, good. We're on the same page there. Uh, okay, uh, we're out of questions. What, what does that guys have coming up? You, you have some big events coming up, don't you? We do. In fact, uh, in light of you know your musicianship, and I like the fact that you bring on music that has a social consciousness to it. For the first year, uh, we're doing this Psychize Media Festival, and I want to plug this because it's a it's a very big thing. I want to get going. It's, you can go to zeitgeistmediafestival.org and check out the lineup we have for the LA and the twenty to thirty other events we have globally across I think about 22 countries which the more of them are inching in but it's it's a week from today it's a 9/11 no real no real relationship to the uh, you know historical uh -huh. stuff uh, but uh, it's going to be an all day event in Los Angeles and of course mirrored across the world where socially conscious artists can come together and communicate an expression in the hope that the audience will f kind of feel that expression. I believe the arts and the Renaissance, for example, are really the initiators of social change more than anything else. It takes yeah. that kind of ex yeah, the experimentation and, and everything. And science really is an art form in a lot of ways, too, at least in its earliest stages of thinking outside of the box and being creative. So this is very important to me because I'm also a musician, and I, I've, I'm, I've, my entire value system has been influenced by the arts ever since I was a kid, right. and I realized the power of this. Hey, you know, we can look to politicians for influence, but if you really look at where the, most of the people on this planet get their values, it comes from the media that they see, at least at this point in history. Just recently, and, uh, I, I kind of threw a little uh, hissy fit, and I kind of called out my whole generation of musicians. Uh, and asked them if they were managing their 401k plans. Like, why haven't we heard anything from from my generation, which in the 1960s almost changed the world? Music right. industry has changed a lot, but there are icons there uh, who w were they to but step forward for a moment or two uh, and really tell the truth now and recognize that the world is in far more trouble now than it was during the Vietnam War, and that was bad yeah. enough. And mm -hmm. yet uh, we seem to have a hard time uniting voices. While you were talking just now, Peter, I, I had this like this hope that wouldn't it be great if uh, if all of a sudden or at some point the Libertarian Party 
uh, all of us in peak oil sustainability transition, you as a zeitgeist, the environmentalists, could all of a sudden realize that we were all allies. Yeah. yeah. That would be a tipping point uh, of enormous uh, uh, importance. We got Randy from Fresno on. Randy, are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, sorry we didn't get to you yet, but here we here we are. What do you uh, got? Yeah, I just wanted uh, it's more less of a question and more of just a, a comment, shout out, and thanks to uh, Peter Joseph, uh, just letting him know we're out here in the Central Valley, California, and uh, we really um, advocate his movement, and we feel like it is one of the only movements out there that addresses the root cause issues in our um, human behavior today. You know, which is talking about you know human behavior and how we have been indoctrinated and conditioned throughout these past two, three hundred years to live this monetary based system and uh, I just want to let them know we're out here advocating it. Um, we got plenty of people uh ready to join the local chapter and um, right. you know we just hope that we can keep pushing it forward for you. Uh thanks so much. Uh, that's what it's about. I really appreciate the Thank energy you're putting ready. forward. Thanks. Yeah. That that that's no good. we we have to show this 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 cross organizational solidarity here. Now that's gonna make us all stronger. Guess what? Yeah. Peter, we we have an email from Chile. Are you ready for that? Sure. I, I have just one question about what do we do with police? Here in Chile, there's been some repression and a killing on one boy at, uh, at, at Collapse Net. We've been uh, covering the very violent uh, student sure. demonstrations that have been going on in Chile. Uh, but the overall issue of police and law enforcement is an important one. Uh, before I turn to you, Peter, just very quickly, I'll say there's a big differ a difference between the federales and the rurales. That's the Mexican way of putting it. But from the federal national police versus the local police, what you want mm -hmm. to do is make very good friends with your local police because they live near you and they're your neighbors. Uh, right. But other than that, uh, Peter, you, 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 I want to take a nap. You talk. <laughs> Well, the issue of police, you know, what are what are police? Police are an outgrowth of a system that has flaws. So if your system's not designed correctly, you need people to maintain order for those that don't have their needs met, so they have to step out and do things that are, quote, against the law, you know. You can see a whole lot, a whole series of contradictions in the way the law system works uh, for what it advocates versus, you know, what it's in, what's in practice versus what the system actually promotes. Uh, the system that we live in now promotes a certain logical violence. It's a violence of humanity. It's an exploitative system. Uh, we have people that have 50-room you know, mansions with two jets parked in their front lawn, and we think that's normality or something to aspire to. And they, the police are there in many ways to protect those super wealthy you know, who will be the first to become victim to this breakdown we talk about, by the way. I could say a lot about that, but I think it's just important to remember that, you know, people, police are just human beings, and they, you know, right. they're, you know, once this breakdown happens, by the way, as an aside, you know, they're not going to protect you. They're going to protect themselves and their family. This okay. is how the human nature kind of instinct works. They're, they, they're going to go out and, you know, it's, it's just unfortunate that we have this sort of traditional f assumption that the police are there for us on one side, and of course we have the abuse issues on another, and we fail to see what the emergence of laws and police really uh, come from, which is this failed economic model. You know, I, in the film you were in, you know, we talk about crime. Basic property crime is the majority of crime. Right. If you could just provide the fundamental needs for a society, the fundamental needs, and I'm not even talking about a resource-based economy, just if, if the basic stuff was there, you'd eliminate a great majority of crimes out there. It's that hyper- a Darwinistic capitalist notion that is such a grave distortion, it's anti-society, uh, that has permeated and created traditional normality, and we just accept these monstrous prison populations, most of which, you know, you know I don't have to go on that. You're, you, you're, your history can explain I'm all that. Over yeah, so, I mean, I just hope that anyone listening can really understand what, what police and laws come from, and that in the future, what we hope is to not hyperbolate towards more security and more police, which is what we're doing now. We want to get rid of laws. We want to get rid of the need to have more police and more security. That's where the society should be going. That should be the we measure. Have, uh, this is okay. right on topic here. I believe we have a caller, because I have this message from the board, anonymous, uh, who works in the government. Is there an anonymous out there on the line? Hey, Mike uh, and Peter, how are you guys doing? Cool. What do you got, man? Hey, well, um, I'm a big fan of both, a um, uh, big fan of your work, but um, obviously the issue here is uh, we can't uh, go forward and, um, you know, be activists just out in the in the world. Um, my question to you guys is, is, is uh, you know, even for Collapse.net and, and for the Zygeist movement, which I am a part of both, we want uh, 
to go out there and freely be activists, but apparently, obviously, we can't. But I want to see if have you guys thought of anything that um, you know we can do as uh, law enforcement or military or in like people that just can't do it out, um, you know, in the open. Listen, yeah, there, there, there's a there's a lot of people out here in government, law enforcement, and the military. You know, it's a, Ron Paul is the single most popular candidate throughout the military. Something oh, yeah. also the press cannot uh, seem to acknowledge. Uh, sure. uh, but that's a very good question, uh, Peter. Do you want to shout? How do people in government with you know who will lose their jobs if it's known that they're protesting? How how how, how can they help? Yeah, I, that's a, that's you know that's one of those those huge problems. You know, especially in an income based system where people need their occupation. That's what keeps people in line. Is really money and that necessity. You know, the military. I know lots of people in the military. I get constant contact with the military that are so supportive of all of this. They know that they're involved in a, kind of a corrupt institution. They know that, that engagement of what they're doing isn't really helping anything right. as far as society. Uh, and I, I always encourage them to, to gently spread that information amongst their peers and then inevitably get out of the military. I mean, I, I really kind of believe in the, the, it, it, the institution itself. If people just didn't acknowledge it, if we didn't have, say, a military channel, <laughs> I discovered this the other day at a friend's house. There's actually a channel on TV called the Military Channel. If that isn't a cultural reinforcement of this institution as some staple of modern, of like everything that's supposed to be normal, I don't know what is. But I say get out, and I, you know, I encourage everyone out there that's in the military that doesn't want to be there. If you, if everyone just stood up and just stopped participating in these actions, uh, there would be nothing to do. Obviously, that's easier said than done. Yes, I but, mean, there's, uh, yeah, there's obviously secrecy. Oh, there's terms of enlistment there's uh you know there's all kinds of binding stuff that well i mean they, if enough people did it they couldn't prosecute everybody if enough well, if, if 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 really that kind of mutiny was able to amass i mean i almost made a movie and i still might called to the military and it's a, basically an open letter to everyone in the armed forces and the police departments to make them question what they're doing because they hold such power it's the military, you know, we talk about all the things that could happen in oppression. Once the military understand that this collapse is going to occur regardless, once the police forces, you know, once all the basic civil, basic uh, security institutions understand that this is going to happen anyway, they need to make a decision. Do they support the current system and protect, you know, the interests of the corporations, or do they turn it around and they, do they force the hand and start to work with the people and try to get a new system in place through that leverage of, of you know the military's angles and weaponry and everything else. I hate to say that. I don't mean that in a violent sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just like just like those coups that have occurred where they manipulate the military and the military goes along with it, like with Hugo Chavez, uh, the military finally snapped out of it and they said, "Boom, we're not going to tolerate this," and they turn right back around on their masters. And I think that's a hopeful, hopeful uh, assumption. So I we'll think what that the uh, turning point will come when people in law enforcement, people in government, the machers, the ones who make things run. Right. Uh, uh -huh. The uh, the uh, and 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 the military recognize or shed a false belief that by doing their job as a cop, as a soldier, as a as a bureaucrat, that they're going to keep their job. What they yeah. what what they really have to understand is the way things are working. They're going to be eaten too, and all they're doing now is standing on the shoulders of people who they're drowning, exactly. only to wind up with the same fate themselves. Um, what's so important for, for, for also what I see happening, too, is, is an awakening around this planet that regardless of nationality, language, or color, we are all one empathic species. Right. Truly what happens to us in Fukushima is happening to us everywhere, you know? Yep. Uh, and am, am I still on the air? Yes, you are. Okay, well, see, my, my thing is that the, uh, the guys, these guys need to realize that we took an oath to defend also against domestic enemies, right. okay? Sure. And that needs to be taken seriously. I just, re I just think they, that they don't realize that it's a reality, that a domestic enemy is real, is, is, is in front of your face. That's why I have so long objected to, again, the Alex Jones thema of uh, concentration camps for everybody, gray three squares a day, Yes, I agree. Uh, because that's just not going to be the case. That's too expensive. There aren't the resources right. to do that for 310 right. million Americans, and certainly the military is too stretched way too thin. We're going to be on our own. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, just keep watching and doing what you can. We appreciate, and I get a collapse net especially, uh, a high-volume uh, 
of, of uh, traffic anonymous from uh, from various parts of the government and law enforcement and, and, and the military. And just know that you're not alone. Right. And, uh, and, I, and there's uh, a list of, of, of people that, you know, okay. they come to me. And, and at some and, point, uh, oops, what's going on? I've lost my sound. And at some point, uh, uh, there's going to be a massive awakening. We have another email, too. We go down about the last five minutes of the show. We've gone through the station break to make up for the time we lost. This is, uh, this is an email from Richard Lewis. <clears throat> what role does intuition and or spirituality fit in problem solving? Intuition is a, quote, natural process and is employed by most species on the planet. I believe intuitive leaps must be made sometimes just to get past roadblocks. For example, take bread. It's been around for at least 12,000 years. I don't think someone at the time guessed on yeast and bacteria uh, interactions along with temperature effects and micro microbiology food sources. There simply wasn't enough information available for the scientific method to be employed. Some of the greatest discoveries were founded on large intuitive leaps. Anyway, great work on the Zeitgeist movies and concepts. Keep up the good fight. That's from Richard Lewis. Peter, you want uh, sure. I think there's two points there. That one is intuition. I would say intuition in the sense of, uh, you know, you look at a cat and how does a cat jump uh, perfectly up onto an eight-foot platform and land in a, a absolute, absolute elegance. Uh, that's an intuition of the, you know, the, chemi- the excuse me, the biology of, of an organism. And we have amazing uh, visual intuition, if you will, where you can watch two, uh, two. Um, two projectiles come in different angles, and your brain will immediately calculate where those two will come together or how far apart they'll be. You'll, you'll notice this when you walk around. If a car's coming your way, you'll be able to navigate. If a bike's coming your way, you'll know if you're going your same velocity, and they are, that you'll hit them, and we, we intuitively do that. But when it comes to invention, which I think is what he's really pointing at, uh, invention is always random, and that's something I think it's very important to realize. There are obviously components with knowledge, but no one really kind of invents anything and it's like a root form you know when someone invented the wheel no one invented the wheel they kind of figured out that say a log fell over a tree fell over and the log rolled and they just found the observation you can call it intuition but i think it's more of uh, something clicking uh, it's hard to get great words for that but as far as the role in decision making obviously there's an experimental quality that always goes along with anything that we do which goes back to the media festival the role of art and science and keeping an open mind and thinking outside of the box and surrounding yourself with so many different cultural variations I mean, you obviously see the difference in uh, thought with, say, one individual that lives in the South and never left his hometown versus someone who's traveled the entire world with lots of exposure. You'll definitely see a difference in creative thought and flexibility of thought. So I think it's you know, just a process of exposure and experimentation and chance, but I'm not sure if intuition is the right word. Well, for, for me, from my spiritual uh, perspective, uh, intuition is, 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 is also inherently a part of plugging into a wisdom that is already there. That doesn't arrive via cognitive processes. Uh, I've always had very, I've been lucky with very good intuition uh, throughout the course of my career as a policeman, uh, and 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 certainly in the in the in the struggle sense. Uh, but um, sure, such things are 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 to be listened to. Uh, inspirations now. I, I I think necessity is the mother of invention, and it's true that in all times of great human conflict, some of the best New ideas are, are 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 forged, if you will, or hammered out in 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 the crucible of the hard times, and and that's kind of what I predicted coming uh, in in the movie Collapse is is that like Zeitgeist movement, for example, like new new wisdoms, uh, maybe old wisdoms that, that maybe that the, the, the semantics are not important, but the awareness of so many other options uh, being available, which is ultimately hope giving. Sure. We're down to about the last minute. Peter Joseph, uh, I'm going to wrap up with my listeners. I want to thank you so much for, for sure. joining us again on the show. We will have you back again. Uh, and, and, and everybody out there in Zeitgeist, please know and understand you have allies at CollapseNet. You have allies in Transition U.S. You, there, we, have, we have allies now in the Libertarian Movement, and certainly with Ron Paul, who is recommending the right financial steps uh, to uh, liberate what we need to liberate now and get doing the things we need to do. Peter, you're a big part of this movement. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. It's an honor, and I just want to remind you and everybody else, I have to remind you, but the entire audience, that we're all in this together, and it's time we start to think about it that way. Absolutely. Peter, we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you for joining us. All right, man. Take care.
right. Everybody, uh, I'm going to be off uh, next uh, Sunday, you know, speaking in Portland. And on the 14th, I'll be jamming with my great buddy Lisa Mann at uh, Duff's Garage. i got a three-song set where I'm going to sing the blues and have some fun. I'll be back with you on September 18th. Uh, upcoming guests will include Transition U.S. I hope to have uh, Caroline State and the executive director. Uh, we may have Jenna Orkin and Rice Farmer as guests, but we got some good guests coming up. Thank you so much. Uh, you've been making us real strong here on the Lifeboat Hour. We'll talk to you soon. Take it easy. Good night. <laughs>